morning, good afternoon, or good evening to all of you. We are delighted to have folks on the call today from all around the globe. I'm Eddie Rhodes, the Marketing Manager for Caterpillar Safety Services. Thank you for joining our webinar today titled View from the Top, Executive Engagement for Safety Improvement. And before we kick off today's presentation, I have a couple announcements. Phone lines are muted, so if you have questions for our presenters or you have technical questions for me, please use the Q&A or areas of WebEx to communicate with me. Uh, we will spend the, the final portion of today's presentation in a Q&A session, so I will read your questions to the presenters at that time. Following the webinar, I will send the presentation slides and a recorded version of the webinar to everyone on the registration list. And finally, as a New Year's gift to this month's webinar participants, we are extending an exclusive and significant discount on Caterpillar's premier safety leadership training product, Start. Following the presentation, I will share a coupon code worth $500 toward the purchase of START, our supervisor training in accident reduction techniques course. Everyone on the call today is eligible for this promotional rate, but the disc is limited to the first 25 of you who place an order. So stay tuned for more details and on code following our Q&A session. Next, to introduce today's presenters. Don Williamson is a senior consultant with Caterpillar Safety Services. My has more than 25 years of experience in the safety profession and works with organizations in a variety of in industries to build and achieve employee-driven safety culture excellence. And our guest co-presenter today is Eric Dick, the Vice President of Operating Services for Pembina Pipeline Corporation, an integrated energy infrastructure service provider with an enterprise value of more than $10 billion. Eric is responsible for the company's safety, environment, and security team, which establishes programs and procedures that help Pembina identify potential risks to safety and the environment, and ensures Pembina maintains consistent performance standards across its four business units. Eric will share with us today his experience leading Pembina through Caterpillar's zero incident performance process. And without further ado, I turn the mic over to Mike and Eric. Thank you very much. Uh, you did a pretty good introduction, I think. Uh, Caterpillar Safety Services uh, is a, uh, a unit of Caterpillar, and, and you people in the audience recognize us as a worldwide power in heavy equipment and a company that is absolutely committed to a culture where our people and our customers do not get injured. Uh, Eric, Dick, uh, do you want to make a brief comment beyond what Abby said? Uh, no, I, I mean, welcome to everyone, and uh, I'm uh, looking forward to the, uh, to the webinar. And I'm not going to add much to it either. Certainly, uh, the more than two decades I've worked uh, in improving safety cultures have um, come to uh, an excellent full point here uh, with Caterpillar and with Pembina. We'll look at uh, visible upper management, how do you get it, and does it really make any difference? So, uh, Eric, one more time, please. Yeah, uh, just maybe just give everybody a brief uh, intro. Maybe we, you can find out more about Pembina on our website, um, www.pembina.com. But uh, we're almost a 60 year old company here in Western Canada. Uh, we run uh, anywhere from uh, you know, upwards of 6,000 miles uh, or about 10,000 kilometers of pipe. Uh, we basically pro uh, uh, ship uh, sales product, uh, crude oil, uh, NGL, natural gas liquids uh, through uh, basically the two, pro two prairie provinces. And uh, we also uh, have uh, fractionators in Redwater, which is Edmonton. And so we, we pretty much have the value chain on liquids uh, from top to bottom. And one thing for sure for Pemina and has been for quite some time is safety is number one for us. And uh, despite being a 60-year-old company, we continue to work to get better at that end of the world. And that's really what this uh, webinar is about, is their experience in getting that upper management commitment and engaging their people and what difference does it make. So uh, to get visible upper management commitment, first thing you've got to get their attention. Many organizations get people's attention by doing the wrong thing, having injuries or a, a, a significant trigger event. I get involved with safety significantly. Uh, uh, more than decades ago, at a court level, we had a fatality with one of our people, and the organization said, and Mike, 
it's to turn around our safety organization. Uh, you are now not in charge of engineering. You're in charge of safety. And I didn't like that. Uh, I liked it in that it say was important, but I didn't like it that they lost their life to get the company finally to approach on that. And I'm going to has a very different story as to how we got the attention or how they got the attention of upper management. Eric, talk to us about that, please. Sure. So back, uh, I mean, as most companies uh, have, we, we were focused for many, many years on lagging indicators. And so at the end of each year, we'd be able to look in the rearview mirror and see how we did. Uh, however, back in 2009, uh, internally, we decided that, that actually we need to find out from our own people what we as a collective unit about uh, safety, uh, you know, management may have a view, others may have a view, and, and there's only one, re one real way to do that, and that was to conduct a perception survey, and at that time employed uh, 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 Cormia back in 2009 to do that uh, survey, and they've done surveys for a number of years and statistically valid, and we wanted to find out how we did uh, and where we were, and our findings were that we were uh, above average, uh, but as we looked in, in some of the categories, and we'll we'll get further on that in the webinar, but there are definitely areas that we wanted to and needed to be better, and uh, the, the survey results provided us with a focus area to uh, to engage in that process. Because as attention didn't come from injuring people, it came from a desire not to injure people. And Eric mentioned Core Media. Uh, Core Media is, uh, was a small company in Oregon that developed this approach to improving safety culture and delivering excellence. And Caterpillar purchased that company uh, a while back. And so now we'll just talk about Caterpillar because it's a part of what Caterpillar is as well. After getting attention, the next level is in what we're doing. And organizations that have a different approaches to improving safety, unfortunately, a lot of them really don't do anything. Some of them are feared of, afraid of regulators or, or significant injuries. Some of them use uh, recognition uh, based on trinkets and trash and belt buckles and hats and the like. Some of them just pay attention to regulations or observation programs. And then there's another issue, and that deals with what is your culture and what are you going to do about that? So, Eric, let's hear about that. Sure. I mean, you know, culture for us, as far as our definition of culture, is just how we do things and how we go about things. And we'll get a little bit more detail here shortly. But uh, really, after the perception survey in 2009, uh, we, we definitely uh, made a commitment at the operational level, management level, that we, we need to engage our folks and and uh, how do we how do we improve our performance it's a uh, it's a uh, it's a how we do things uh, improvement uh, is, is the best way to improve our our, our day-to-day -day work but at that point in time we chose to engage our operational business units uh, where bulk of our folks uh, work and and I might add we you know we're a company with 800 employees over half of which are in the field and over half of those people that do all the more dangerous work and, and uh, need to address that. But we also engaged our, our uh, Board Health Safety Environment Committee and the entire board of directors and presented to them the results of the perception survey and the areas that we wanted to focus and really the, the, interest, the interest at all levels and, and even our board of directors would really wanted an in-depth uh, uh, process to understand the culture and work hard to improve it. So we uh, very quickly had engagement right from the top. So, uh, move from an interest to desire, uh, how did you end up working with the Caterpillar and making the choice to just to go with them? Because there's plenty of other safety uh, organizations out there you could have chosen from. Sure, Mike. I mean, uh, myself, uh, 35 years uh, uh, in the in the oil industry, oil and gas industry. Uh, I have you know, a fair bit of personal experience with a number of different firms. And on our board, we have uh, very eligible uh, folks within operations and safety, and, and all of us are committed to safety. So, you know, we look around and we reviewed uh, uh, different options with our peers within the industry. Uh, uh, went through, we've talked to Atco Electric, who Keller had used, so we checked some references, and and uh, we decided then to... Um, to uh, uh, actually bring uh, Caterpillar in, bring Mike in, and, and went through a bit of a process with them to to rehab, uh, uh, you know, to, to know what, how, and, and how Caterpillar and how Mike 
uh, works and really with all of our uh, past experience and board experience and reference checks we did we had a good feel that this was uh, this is something this is something uh, that we wanted to pursue and the process involved so uh, you know a lot of personal experience and and I guess learnings and uh, maybe past failures that uh, we didn't want to repeat, and, and that's how we zeroed in on Caterpillar's process. It was, you know, as a presenter to the Pembina organization, from my standpoint, uh, pretty interesting, and yet also I had to go through the gauntlet. Uh, Eric had me come up to his board of directors meeting, uh, the board of directors for a $10 billion company. We They sat around the table, and I presented to them, and then they did Q&A. And for that, I certainly knew that Pembina was a serious organization and that they had knowledgeable people and that they were committed and they were interested enough to the point for you need to come up here and we need to interview you to make sure that you are fit for our organization. Uh, they did a superb job. So, uh, moving on then, uh, attention, interest, desire, action. And how did you get from so coming up and talking to your board of directors through actually uh, losing Caterpillar to work with, Eric? Uh, I mean, you know, once we had uh, commitment from the top and, and uh, had had uh, Mike up several times and presented to different uh, levels of both management, operational safety staff, and the board, uh, and, and we've chosen uh, uh, Caterpillar, we then spent some time with Caterpillar going through uh, the methodology and and all that good stuff, and, and uh, went through different phases of proposals, and, and actually uh, were able to penalize it, if you will, uh, a little bit, and how we wanted to do things, and they were very amenable to do that, and, and work within our system and our timing, and, uh, and so that really, you know, uh, got to the level where we we uh, then initially decided that you know to get buy in to make sure that a lot of our operational uh, Staff in the field and supervisory staff were on board or were aware of how we wanted to go about this. We then established a safety excellent workshop uh, process and, and presented to them. We, these are one-day sessions and covered, uh, you know, about 10% of our of, uh, of our total staff, 80 some odd people, which represents a good 20% of our field staff, uh, so that they have a good uh, flavor of what we want to do and, more importantly, engage with them. And I think this also established a very, very prime issue for us, and that was to make sure that we had their trust, that this was the and why we were going to do it, and how we were going to do it, and the process we were going to follow. And I think that was a that was a very significant and, and uh, early uh, successful step. So the action dealt with dealing with the people on the front line that truly have to uh, be engaged with improving the safety culture. And I did an excellent job of that. So from then, uh, the Caterpillar process, ZIP, Zero Incident Performance Process, has a number of steps to it, kind of like plan, do, check, act in, in quality excellent organizations. I'd like to go through these relatively quickly. So the first one deals with engaging the leadership of the organization. And we did a leadership roundtable, kind of, a uh, two-day event in Calgary with the upper management of and Eric, uh, give us a little background on this, please. Yeah, we there, uh, we we sat, assembled the operational uh, business unit leaders. Uh, our president sat in as well. Our uh, field uh, safety and environment uh, advisors that work in our field offices and and with Mike's help, we the down table actually went through our 2009 perception survey results in uh, quite a bit more detail and what they meant, uh, each each one of the categories we'll talk about here shortly meant and, and what the survey results meant. Um, and we got us to focus on, on what the issues were, where they where they communicated issues internally, were they cultural issues, and, and really I think it's kind of like a Tetris scheme. You know, a lot of those blocks now fell into, pl fell into place for, for everyone in the room for two days. And we really talked about, you know, the five W's and the H, you know, who uh, needs to be involved in and 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 uh, when and and where and and what the messages would be and and uh, uh, how we were going to deliver and and really this, this really made a difference that really was an excellent kickoff to the whole process. That engagement session really uh, explains the process that we're going to go through, answers people's questions, and.
Trump. Then they make a decision, are we going to go forward or not? But they have enough data, enough information, enough one-on-one to make that decision. And I think it was really important for me to, to, to uh, I think the last and biggest thing that we really made a difference for that group was, is the, is, are these the type of people we want to deal with? Is this the kind of process that's going to fit with how PEMINA works? And that was, you know, that really comes down to a bit of a tummy feel at the end of the day, and, and that was a unanimous uh, affirmative. That's, uh, that was a big kickoff for us. Uh, kind of a, now a, a few series of slides of so what we show at this uh, initial engagement meeting. We at Caterpillar have some models we use that explain what safety is and what culture is and, and how you adjust that. Incidents, uh, when you look at the data, typically come from at-risk behaviors that occur at the front line. And so what are you going to do about that? Uh, some organizations decide that when you address the employee that made the mistake, uh, you know, observation programs are kind of catch and correct. The real issue with at-risk behaviors, though, are the attitudes, beliefs, and ideas that exist in the field. And those are not only hourly employees, but their supervision. And supervision gets those from upper management. Truly, when you look at incidents, they come from the norms of an organization that we've been. And those norms truly function as a culture. So instead of a particular focus on at-risk behaviors, basically writing traffic tickets one at a time, uh, the Caterpillar approach focuses in on what's your culture and what are some of those issues in that culture that lead to the ideas, beliefs, and attitudes that have occurred over time that lead to risk behaviors. We're going to focus in on the culture and resolve the at behaviors by improving that culture. Truly, those are the root causes. Eric, comments on this? Yeah, I mean, you know, despite uh, having better than average uh, safety results uh, uh, for Pemina being a 60-year-old company, you know, it was it was clear that we have, uh, you know, a 60-year-old company with many long-serving employees and and supervisors, and and over time, uh, many district offices had their way of doing things, and and. Uh, you know, maybe not as consistent, and definitely not as consistent as, as uh, and uniform across the uh, whole organization. So, you know, one of the things that we found when we looked at uh, incidents uh, from 2008 to 2010 is, you know, unfortunately, uh, you know, a good third, if not better, of those more of those incidents were people not following standard operating procedures, and uh, ironically enough, that, that's that's occurring with the people that would get hurt first. And you know that's mystifying to a lot of us, but really that is the norm. That was the culture, as as many discussions we had with people, is that was their their new routine. That was routine to them, and it's not routine for for a lot of us that were newer to the company. Uh, that had to change because we have established uh, uh, standard operating procedures that people weren't following because they found and maybe got lucky over time that they worked. They were able to shortcut things. That's just not the right thing to do. So back to the attitudes, beliefs, and ideas. And past, uh, something that kind of invisible to the safety culture. Now, with looking deeper into the culture, you can see that those bumps in the road need to be worked on. Uh, another one of the models we use is the six criteria for safety excellence, uh, developed by uh, probably the most industri famous industrial safety uh, person in the last 50 years, Dr. Dan Peterson. Uh, how is upper management visibly committed to safety? And, and middle management, how are they actively involved? Frontline supervision focus on safety performance the same way they focus on cost reduction or customer service or quality. And hourly employees, uh, they're the ones that are getting injured. Are they actively participating in safety or are they just putting on their PPP, PPE and going to work? Is there flexibility? because a number of different trades in every organization, especially in the pipeline organization as well. And that last one, uh, the positive perception of the workforce, this is the feedback loop. Uh, you find out what the real issues are, and then first four are engaging your people in solving what those issues are. So this is kind of a guideline that we use for all organizations, the engagement of their people in improved safety culture. Back to yeah, this is uh, these six criteria for every one of our improvement teams. Uh, 
this is the uh, the base uh, uh, to for each one of the issues that they may address and come up with solutions for them. these six criteria need to be satisfied in some way shape or form and so it's a really a focus for each one of the teams as they work through their uh, their issue at hand and, and and uh, we'll a final solution or recommendations. Good. Uh, the really this is our filter. And so when the teams deliver a solution to a particular issue, where is top management visible in that solution? How are hourly employees participating in that solution and the like? And so the teams answer that question. It makes a difference in safety. Here's another model that we use all the time with organizations. And the foundational level really regulations. Uh, these uh, regulations are written around conditions and so we're reacting to conditions. And, and this is something that absolutely has to happen. Uh, foundational basic for safety. But if all you do is react to conditions, it's just not good enough. So, uh, the next level deals with reacting to what we see in the workplace. And this Whoa, that was close. What are we going to do about it? Observation programs and the like. And so, uh, injury rates go down as we react to both conditions and what we see. It's not good enough. So, that leads to kind of level three, and this is what we do. These are safety accountabilities, and the teams deliver solutions to activities and accountabilities that engage our people across the organization. That improves safety performance. Next up, then, is diagnostic. And here we're trying to get between the ears of our people, hourly and salaried people, to find what the issues really are. Not only we don't do too well, but there's some things in the organization that they do very, very well. And how do we build on the successes to improve the areas where we need to get better? And that really is level five. And these are continuous improvement teams focused in on what the organization knows needs to be improved to eliminate the possibility of injuries. And at first, uh, you do that scan, level four, finding out what the issues are, lots of things to work on. And the teams are working on those things, and as they start fixing those, more and more stuff appears as to what needs to be working on, worked on. At the same time, however, level six occurs, and that's a passionate leadership to get to zero. And here, these teams deliver hourly and salary leaders that have a relentless focus on doing whatever it takes to eliminate the possibility of injuries. It is an engagement model. It's very similar to a Deming used in quality. These are continuous improvement teams focused in on what's not right, and they deliver solutions for conditions and they deliver accountabilities for actions. And so, uh, back to you. Yeah, I mean, when we look at this model, uh, as we're pending as and is, uh, and, and where we're going, we also take uh, a hard look at the right hand side and incident rates. And, and admittedly, uh, you know, I've, I've, I've put us into some, you know, uh, maybe a conservative uh, level of under, of, of reading or ranking, but, you know, we started uh, with moderate incident rates. We're, we're better than the average. And, and had you know, had all of level one and two covered, and, and, and a few things in level three, you know, maybe the 60 40. Uh, we've worked hard over the last year where we're, we think we're moving up, uh, and we, we, we are certainly looking. We can now look back at our 2012 uh, lagging indicators, and and uh, we've seen some significant improvement. Uh, can I tag that all on our safety culture improvement uh, project? Uh, probably not legitimately, but I think that it is an attitude. Uh, as an example, you know, our, our staff. Because of most of our our uh, assets are linear assets and, and cover 6,000 miles, we do a lot of driving. And our motor vehicle incident rate in 2012 is down 50% from 2011. So, wow. um, you know that's that's really good news, and we, that was happening through the year. That's not a attitude thing. Um, we can we can drive safer, but you see, I think we've now we are into level four. Uh, we're still working on some things in level three for sure on, on accountability systems. We're at level four, and, and actually, we're, we've probably touched into some level fives with our continuous improvement team. So, definitely moving up on the scale, and, and our goal is to uh, to get to that level five, six uh, on a very regular basis. So safety um, complex, and uh, those of you in the audience, I probably don't need to tell you that. 
but uh, there are management systems, there's working conditions, there's human behaviors, uh, and there's 800 people that are engaged in every one of these things. And the model here is kind of a filter. And so what we've got is a, a dynamic. These filters are rotating 24-7, some forward, some back, and each one of these filters, the behaviors, the systems, the conditions, have got some holes in them. And when those holes line up, there's an incident, and somebody standing in the way of an incident becomes an accident. And how do we work on this? Well, we're back to the continuous improvement teams, and they're focused in on the behavioral issues, the condition issues, the systems issues, and their assignment really is to plug the holes, to get these rotating filters or gears to where we've improved them, and there's a possibility of incident. Uh, a model that we explain to upper management, to hourly employees, and everybody in between. Comments, sir? Yeah, you know, I think that what you see here on this uh, this uh, diagram, you know, the holes uh, from our perspective is, you know, those are those are the items that have been identified from our perception survey. Those are the things that need to be plugged and worked on, and, and, and as we uh, work through on our CIT teams, continuous improvement teams, that's what we're doing. We're trying to plug these holes, uh, big, small, medium, so that there is no chance that they line up at the end of the day. So it's uh, there's lots of different levels, and there's lots of different sizes of holes, and uh, we're just trying to do our best and, and work through our safety culture improvement project to fill as many as we can, and, and as we go, hopefully we have no red arrows coming through for an incident. So uh, that uh, portion of the engagement session where we train uh, the upper management that's going to make the decision as to whether they're going to follow this process or not, and from that then uh, an assessment. And uh, let's take a look at uh, the safety perception survey, the assessment that Caterpillar uses worldwide, uh, developed again by that famous safety a guru of the last 50 years, Dan Peterson and others on their team, and they spent 10 years developing uh, an assessment tool and did statistical validations along the line. Certainly the the most robust of any of the surveys I've ever seen. Hourly provision and management, everybody takes part in that, and it gives kind of a baseline for the improvement process. Uh, yeah, it worked well. It was easy to do. It's easy to conduct, and, and uh, the proof's in the pudding at the end of the day when the results come out and analyzed, uh, analyzed it effectively. So here's the safety management categories that are used. There's 20 of them. Uh, look at the lower left-hand corner, hazard correction, incident analysis, inspections. These are kind of standard for safety, but after 10 years of work, uh, Peterson, Bailey, and Associates found out that there were a lot of other things that were very important in safety. How do you involve your employees? Uh, sure, we train supervision, but quality of supervision in the upper right-hand side, how do we measure how well they're doing what we train them to do? And uh, recognition, do we give them positive feedback for what they're doing right? Or on the left-hand side, do we just discipline them for doing something wrong? Are we, are we a safety cop culture? Or are we safety? coaching culture. And, and where's management credibility in this? You can see as you look at this, there's a lot of depth here. And so those filters, the barriers that prevent our people from getting injured, there's plenty of them um, that Peterson found and statistically validated. And survey leads an organization to error-proof each one of these statistically valid safety management processes. And so here's the Pembina Safety Perception Survey back from 2009. Eric? Uh, and, you know, you can see from these, this is a corporate uh, result. We, we, we actually are able to, on uh, the perception survey, have it down by business unit or down by district office so we can actually zoom in if there is any specifics. But this is the overall corporate summary. And you can see from the legend on the bottom with the color scheme, there's lots and lots of places where, you know, Pembina is classified as world class. But I think the really the important thing uh, piece is on the right-hand side with uh, perception gaps. And so, you know, employee manager perception gap uh, basically says when it's colored red is the employees uh, thought this was an issue and the manager levels uh, not so much. And so we're, we're interested in the gap and these gaps, the red boxes, we'll talk a little bit more. Those are the focus areas for us out of the, out of the 20 categories. And a slightly different approach. Uh, so the 
third uh, column in the center is our global average with tens of thousands of people across all kinds of industries. And you can see from that on the left column, the Hambana really scored a lot better than the average bear, uh, and yet not good enough for zero. So the next step here is let's take a look at the bottom 10 hourly processes. And when the statistics were run with the survey, it was found that people closest to work were closest to safety reality. Um, and that makes a lot of sense. Uh, where does supervision line up with it? And where does upper management line up with safety reality? From uh, a Pembina standpoint, this is a good chart because of the 10 bottom ones. Often of them, there's absolute agreement by the organization that we need to work on these things. So, uh, some insight here. I mean, you know, the top 10, there's good, you know, there's this scatter diagram. They line up really, really well. Uh, and I think the other thing for, uh, as a company, as we look, the top three or four, if you look across the top, are one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three, almost uh, identical in each one of the columns. And, and that really allows us and, and provided us with an area to focus on first. We're not going to go down and and worry about uh, if you take a look at the bottom left hand side management credibility it's not any one of those three category uh, three or uh, organizational levels uh, 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 target side so we're going to be going this is this gives us our guide this is taking the 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 blinders off and saying this is where we want to focus and that's what we've done so uh, once that assessment's in place we're going to build plan and that's uh, comes through a safety steering committee uh, and the steering committee not only prioritizes the issues, they develop and choose the continuous improvement teams, and they develop a communication plan to keep the organization in track as to what we're, we're going to do. And the thing I should comment on is that you know people may make connections. We, we did the perception survey in '09. We really didn't take any action until '12. And really, what that speaks to is we had good intentions with the perception survey back in '9 and analyzed. It in the first quarter of 2010, and then put it on the shelf and just said, yeah, you know, we're going to get to this. Um, you know, but in 2011, third quarter of 2011, we, 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 you know, we asked Mike and Caterpillar said, you know, our survey is about two years old. How good, how statistically valid it is? And Mike asked us the very basic question. What have you done with the results? And honestly, we had to say, not a lot. And he said, geez, because it was statistically valid, you're company hasn't really changed business it's probably still valid and true it was and so uh, you know our goal was to use it and continue to build on it and you'll see that we will, we will survey eventually further further down the line to get us get there but uh, yeah so I think the really the the first piece here was to then uh, uh, build a safety steering team internally to add uh, the focus to the whole process Let's take a look at a safety steering team. One of the models we use is POP. POP. What purpose, what are the outcomes or deliverables, and what's the process by which you achieve those outcomes? And so the safety steering committee of Pembina was to create a zero by choice strategy that uh, includes safety starts with me attitude. And so develop an ongoing plan. First of all, got to maintain what's working well. You saw from the charts, PEM is a lot of things correctly, so we're not going to throw those things out, but we're going to focus our improvement areas where the safety perception survey said we needed to work on, and yet there's some flexibility. So Eric talked a little bit about preventable vehicle incidents. You didn't see that on the chart, and yet you can use the improvement process to fix other things outside of the safety perception survey. Uh, Comments? Yeah, yeah, I think it was very important for us to establish uh, uh, a messaging uh, that was very consistent throughout. And so the hearing committee that we had, we we worked on it quite a bit with Caterpillar's help in, in coming up with what does this mean to us, what's our purpose, and and read it the other day is the zero by choice. It's not a uh, it's not anything other than you know our targets have to be zero in everything we do. And then safety starts with me. It was a it was a big uh, moniker that if I'm safe. And me as any one of us, is if I'm safe and I make sure that it's safe for my fellow workers around me and everybody has that attitude, that they have a really, really good shot of, of, uh, of zero. So after purpose comes outcomes, uh, here world-class safety uh, eliminates lost time injuries. Now, um, 
you've got to go beyond lost time injuries, but uh, these are the major hurdles out there. And so, okay, if you want to focus on lost time injuries first, that's fine. But count on in our continuum, we're getting down to medical injuries. We're getting down to any injuries or incidents that could have led to an injury. And so uh, kind of a first two-year plan, uh, way on just focusing on, on what are we going to train from a regulation standpoint, a two-year plan of what are these statistically valid processes that we're going to work on. And there's some training that goes with it, some support. Uh, we charter these teams, and the teams say, this is what we're going to deliver. This is who's going to deliver it. This is how long it's going to take. This is resources. Etc. This is a serious, in-depth approach to delivering outcomes, results that are measurable, not only from an injury standpoint, but from a culture standpoint. And you can see it doesn't take 200 people on a team. We're just looking five to seven. Back, right? Yeah. So this is our plan. This is the steering committee has come up with a roadmap for the for the corporation and has uh, the steering committee. We've used the. Uh, as stated before, we use our focus uh, areas that we've identified from the uh, perception survey because that's what our people say we should work on, and those are our focus areas. Then, then rather than have uh, us uh, in, in head office and management say, "Here's what you need to do," we will be in, we have and will continue to engage specific teams to work on specific functions that the steer or the specific issues come from the perception survey that the steering committee wants. To have worked on first, second, third, fourth, etc., by a very small focus group that is actually cross-functional um, and cross-business units. So we have a good cross-company uh, representation on each one of these teams. Provide them the training, provide them the support, and encourage them to come up with some solutions that are going to work. The purpose outcome process steering committee meets every month. They review the progress on the teams. This, they talk about injuries or incidents. They talk about what the teams are doing to eliminate those. And that's the continuous improvement approach. And uh, some examples uh, of, of what some organizations focus in on on year one objectives, and Eric will talk to us about what they chose. Uh, later on in the presentation, any comments on this, Eric? Yeah, I think it's you know the regular monthly meetings. Uh, there's lots of our uh, uh, employees. Um, you know, what does the steering committee uh, do? Uh, uh, who's on it, and all that good stuff. And we use our employee news, uh, connection newsletter that comes out every other week to continue to to talk about that, to show the progress. Uh, each one of our steering committee members, who are made up of cross-functional across the districts in our company, you know, go back and and communicate what's happening and and uh, how the interrelationships uh, are going, and, and we need to continue to have consistent messaging. Uh, we've seen the continuous improvement teams, which we'll talk about here in a few minutes, uh, what they've done. That's another 21 employees. So there's lots. You know, it's it's uh, it's spreading out there, and the word uh, the word gets out. Um, and you know, it's really really uh, interesting when you have a meeting, and those of us in management, we all know that the real conversations happen after. Real conversations happen out there at the water cooler or the coffee station out there in the offices, and you very quickly, either positively or negatively, will get that feedback uh, on how it's going. And, and for us, the last eight or nine months since we started, we've had tremendous feedback and really, really encouraging uh, uh, news back from the employees. So that's a, that's a really it feels good, and it uh, it really helps promote uh, our our success and progress with the with the program. And one of the issues. That, you know, continue comes up is I'm going to put an hourly employee uh, in a meeting with a senior vice president, number two man in the corporation. Uh, isn't that going to be kind of intimidating to this hourly person? Are they just going to clam up? Uh, you had a meeting yesterday of the steering committee, and one of your hourly frontline technicians, Rod, had an interesting comment. Could you give us a soundbite on that, Eric? Sure. I mean, you know, eight nine months ago, uh, we we went. You know, a year ago, we went out for volunteers. We got volunteers. Uh, Rod was one of the volunteers, and of course, comes to his first steering committee back in in uh, April last year, and very apprehensive of how this is going to work because he's sitting there with some senior people, and uh, really, uh, you know, when he found out that all stripes are left at the door, uh, you know, he was uh, legitimately, you know, how's this going to work? Uh, nine, ten months later, uh, his comments back yesterday is he can't believe it. Uh, it, it you know, had uh, equal input, and 
you know, lots of folks uh, in his home home base have asked him how this has worked and how certain people uh, treat treat uh, you know uh, each other, and it's been very constructive. He was uh, he's you know eternally he's a very advocate for us because he's very enthused and it's really worked out uh, even better than he would have imagined. So it's a, it's a good feedback loop. I, I remember his comment was that. After the first continuous improvement team meeting, which he was on as a steering team representative, uh, they said, well, why don't you text uh, Eric, senior vice president, and see what he has to say? And so he says, well, why don't I do that? He texted him, and then afterwards as he was driving home, he says, holy mackerel, what have I done? And uh, the answer was, Eric? Uh, I returned his phone call within minutes and had the discussion, and uh, he was satisfied, and uh I guess, as it turns out with this comment from yesterday, he's, uh, he was quite uh, pleased how that went, and it wasn't a, uh, uh, you know, uh, who do you, you know, who do you think calling and what do you think you're doing? Uh, it was a, a equal team member on the steering committee, and we resolved things quite quickly, and he was pleased with the result. And so, uh, really, the steering team and the continuous improvement teams are very functional approaches to break down the barriers between different levels of the organization. And that truly is is one of the purposes of them. So from that then, uh, let's look at developing leadership skills on these continuous improvement teams and the steering teams and frontline employees. And so uh, one of the approaches Caterpillar uses is a safety culture excellence workshop. And here, uh, the people at the field level are given some of those same models. Remember I showed you at the start uh, some decision on the success stories, uh, information on the upcoming plan. Basically, it's a communication strategy. And Eric uh, and Pemba, they use this a lot. Eric? Yeah, I mean, these were these were key uh, excellent workshops to kick off the whole, uh, this is even before our first continuous improvement team was uh, was uh, laid out and, 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 uh, and brought together. But this this basically laid out for all the supervisors and, and uh, in the supervisors, people, foreman level, middle level, management to get everybody familiar with the program and some of the basics and so that uh, at the end of the day these uh, supervisory folks will we're going to be leading us their people to work on the continuous improvement teams had to be aware and to be engaged and this also allowed them to uh, Q&A back and forth on how this was going to work and and what it meant because uh, uh, we are asking for their support and um, and is required. Uh, ask might be a bit uh, conservative. We we need their support, and uh, and we certainly got it. And we are we are borrowing their people to to uh, to come up with a solution. So this is a really, really good um, uh, precursor to the whole program, and and really set the stage. And and actually, I think re really, uh, engaged the trust level from uh, from people we needed most. How many of these did you get? Uh, we went through uh, approximately ten presentations. And, uh, and and covered everybody off, and, and that it, as much as we we like to ask for participation, these workshops were mandatory. And, uh, and across the province, and basically setting up uh, what it takes to be successful. Uh, the teams uh, volunteers only. Uh, Eric talked a little bit about that. Uh, if these if we just assign people to it's a task. So we find when we ask for people, we get people engaged that want to be there. You saw a pop. Purpose, outcome, process. Uh, this is the way we run the teams. And what do they work on? Complaints. Remember the safety perception survey talks about things that aren't right. And we don't turn complaints into grievances. We turn them into goals. And the teams work on the goals. And, and how do they do that? AIM, action item matrix. Next couple of slides are going to explain that. And so uh, one of the tools we use, continuous improvement tools, is a cause and effect diagram. Here's an example, not out of Pembina but another organization that was having trouble with incidents that really weren't right. And so this brainstorming tool allows you to look at what's causing our problems, uh, looking only at conditions, not real good participation and the like. What is this? This brainstorming tool is a list of complaints that the people work on, and we turn those complaints into an action item matrix. And so our teams work on what we say needs to be fixed. Ten column action item task, uh, who team, uh, target date, time, and some comments. This is the way these teams keep track of what they have to do and who's going to do it. Eric, and steering committee uses the same uh, uh, a 
action item matrix, and actually we we uh, we we actually use it for our agenda as we go through meetings. It shows completed items. It shows things we want to talk about, and so it's a multi-purpose uh, document. And, and uh, I, I think at any point in time, uh, you can take a look at our steering committee action item matrix and know exactly what we've done over the last year. Thank, thank you. Uh, and those, that then leads to accountabilities. So as the team members solve these particular tasks, they deliver accountabilities. And they deliver accountabilities from the top of the organization down to the bottom. This is an example of what they would, would deliver. And the steering team makes sure that these are on target. So the continuous improvement team say, this is the accountability you want. The steering team approves or makes modifications as necessary. And that then leads to the implementation process. And we don't just have a solution enrolled across the organization. We pilot it to make sure it's functional and works in the field. Eric talked a little bit about that. So where we're headed not looking at downstream indicators, but looking at the upstream activities that drive those downstream results. We take a look at those fundamental processes, we develop accountabilities that we hold people responsible to do, and total personnel involvement is not 100% of the people on the teams. Remember Eric talked about how he had about 70 of his 800, about 10% that are wanting to be on the teams, but they deliver the abilities that everybody follows. So practice doesn't make perfect. Really what we're after for is perfecting what goes on, and then perfect practice makes for perfect performance. So from that then, um, we're going to check the results and see how they fit in with the strategic plan to move forward. Really what we're doing, you could look at, is kind of developing uh, crops. Um, this continuous improvement plan uh, looks at the soil and we we've, what do we have to do with the soil and we plant the seeds and we water it and we stay engaged and when we start developing the fruits of our labors we can't walk away from this field the culture that we're zero injuries from still has to be paid attention to so and it's not this isn't a quick fix and they've been in the process here for a year and there's more coming so we're building a safety culture and kind of three steps. The initiative, uh, take a survey, form those teams. The teams deliver the principles, and we live those principles and values, and that really delivers the success of the operation. So showing that visible upper management commitment, uh, the steering team uh, kind of is the makeup of one of these steering teams that is now looking forward, not at injuries, but it processes that eliminate injuries. Eric? Yeah, so we, we made sure, I mean, our focus was that this can't be a 25-person committee. We have 800 people in the company. This is going to be 10 people. That was the, uh, that's 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 all we need. Um, and and really, it's a, the cross-representation. This is a bit of a summary on, on, on the ranges we have in each level, but really it's three three parts uh, senior management in the form of uh, either senior managers or vice presidents. Um, and seven parts uh, for, for our employees, su uh, field supervisors, and a manager. So we're pretty really functioning across, but the big piece here is seven, seven to ten are people from the field. And that's where we're going to have uh, uh, the best the, the ideas come from, and we're going to steer this whole group of ten, steers uh, each one of the teams. We also have... Uh, you know, quote, non-voting support from administration personnel, communications personnel, or regulatory folks to assist us in getting the message out and making sure we're 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 addressing the right things as well. So, uh, voting is probably a, a, a misnomer. There actually hasn't been any votes because we actually had a collective group of ten that have really come together and and that done well as a steering committee. But really the important piece here is for the rest of the corporation, when over half our, half our staff are in the field, 70% of the makeup. The steering committee is from the representatives. Thank you. And the, the part of the piece is that the steering team meets every month. They meet once a quarter, once a year. They don't really get much done. So every month we're staying focused in on what does it take to deliver zero incident performance in our safety culture. And then uh, we train the steering committee. You saw some of those models that we use, continuous improvement teams or rapid improvement workshops. There's a charter that goes with that. And from that, then the steering team selects what's going to be worked on. They've got the safety perception survey, so 
they have input from the field. And now this leadership determines where the priority and focus is going to be. Eric? Yeah, the, uh, as a steering committee, my recommendation to anyone out there that's going to be doing the same thing is we, we wanted to win early. And, uh, you know, we didn't want to take the toughest topic in our view and, and have that as the first topic. So we wanted to win early. And, and uh, the, what, what we chose was positive safety recognition was our, was our CIT number one. Uh, uh, it's no, no different at home, at work, at play. It's always easier to critique than give positive uh, feedback. It's always easier to find something wrong or criticize. It, it's kind of like your kids coming home from school and they have four A's and a D. Uh, first thing you're going to say is, geez, what the heck happened with the D? Uh, we want to we want to capitalize and, and focus in on the A's and support them to improve on the D, but focus in on it. So positive safety recognition was number one. Uh, and that's made a, a big difference. That team started in May of last year, gone through a pilot through middle of last year, and rolled out a uh, corporate uh, final solution, final being a misnomer. We continue to continue to improve on that. But they've now finished their work, and that was eight or nine months of involvement. Uh, not, not what difference months. did you see uh, in positive recognition? Well, it was a real change because uh, you know now we're talking about you know uh, 90 to 95 percent of the time our people are working safely. And so now we're you know we're focused in on talking about that 90 to 95 percent of the time instead of in the days where we would talk about the five percent of the negative side and we'd spend 95 percent of our time talking about it. Uh, we have to correct those absolutely and identify and correct them. But now now we're we're making a difference because people are being recognized in a sincere manner uh, and there's a process through that uh, on a regular basis and we have. Uh, you know, safety recognition cards. They're small little pocket cards, and uh, we have weekly uh, summaries that come out uh, that that is also reported to right to the top, upper management and executive. And now getting anywhere from 40 to 60 cards a week. So on a five-day work week, we're getting 10 to 12 cards per day, company-wide, on on from things to large things. We've even had a couple of positive safety recognitions that have now turned out to be economic. Uh, Benefits for the company, which we hadn't really backed on, but uh, it's been significant. So we're we're it's making a difference. So instead of being a safety cop, you're more of a safety coach. And how does that fit into the national sport of Canada, hockey? Well, I think you know the, one of the analogies for the for the for the hockey hockey folks out there, we do a lot of that. But uh, you know, it's kind of it's kind of like the coach. Uh, if your hockey coach on the bench is cool, calm, collected, and focused on the uh, on the uh, Objectives. Uh, your players are that way. If your coach on the bench is a yeller, screamer, and uh, throwing hockey sticks and all that kind of stuff, uh, unfortunately, your players take on the same attitude, and it's not conducive to the end result. Um, uh, and then bring on our CAT number two is near miss system. They got started in the third quarter, and they're into their pilot stage at this point in time. And our last one got started late in the year incident investigation process, which will be going to pilot here mid year. One thing I would say, uh, in, in anyone that's, we had 10 topics we wanted to use and or, or work on. I asked Mike back a year ago that, you know, we did about three a year. He said that would be a, quite an achievement. I didn't quite believe him at the time, but that turned out to be a heavy year, uh, three, because it, if you if you think about our three right now, we have one that's just finished rolling out a final solution, one's in the middle of a pilot, and another one that's going to pilot. That puts a heavy burden on our field folks when we try to introduce all this stuff. So I think our 2013 year will be a little more uh, deliberate because one thing we do not do, did not any of the teams, is put a time limit on them. It needs to be the right solution in the right period of time and do it, we want to do it right, not in a hurry. So 2013 will probably see us uh, with two more teams instead of a three. Three was very aggressive. Okay. Yep. And so uh, these teams then uh, show that, that commitment, and you can see that a typical team has one steering team member, uh, three to four frontline hourly employees, one to two supervisors, and a manager. Back to cross-functional, back to across the organization, back to focused in on what the issues are in the field. And the steering team members and observer and the safety rep uh, on the on that team is an observer they're observers they don't make up the five to seven the five to seven are made up of the front line the hour early and one manager but uh, the skin committee members as an observer and the safety rep as an observer are not they lead the teams the teams find their own leader within their group of five to seven okay, thank you. 
And, uh, they, the rapid improvement teams are trained and in the fundamentals, in the messages, uh, in the models, and how to run these teams, and they develop the solution. So our people develop our solutions to our problems, and we pilot that solution through a target work group. They're trained. They develop the accountabilities. There's a recognition piece that goes with it, an audit, a communication piece. This is a structured approach to work on the issues that our people say need to be worked on. And once that's been completed, the pilot, and the steering committee reviews and agrees to it, then the solution is rolled out. So from that then, uh, what difference does all this make? Because we're down to the last four minutes. Eric, take us home. Well, you know, I think it's uh, what we've seen. We've been very pleased with how it's gone. Uh, you know, there's all apprehension when you start, but uh, the commitment for lots of folks, uh, you know, we've got 10. We've been out there. We have now had excellence workshops with at least 70 to 80 at the supervisory level. We've got 10 people on the steering committee. That's uh, That takes us to, to, to 80, 90. We've got uh, three teams of five to seven each. That's another 20, 25 people. So, you know, we we're, we're now have 115 to 120, include our board. Uh, you know, we're approaching 130, 30 out of 800 people that are intimately engaged with the safety culture improvement project. So that's significant. And I still have another 50 or 60 on the volunteer list. So, you know, that, that tells me that we've got 20, 25% of our folks engaged. It's really going well. Uh, we're going to actually, you know, probably late 13, early 14, do another perception survey to see where we are and how we've uh, done with the gas. Uh, feedback to date has been very, very positive. And uh, like I say, the, the water cooler talk is really where the hardcore good feedback comes from. And, and we've heard lots and really good things. So we are very pleased with our first year. It's been a lot of hard work the first year, but I think we've done a lot of the hard, uh, the hard parts early, uh, reasonably well. And we're all always learning through this whole process. So none of us are experts at this point in time, but it's been a good team effort today. Thank you for that conclusion. And uh, now, Abby, we're back to you. All right. Thanks so much, guys. We do have several great questions from our participants today. So I'll read them to you, uh, and then you can provide your answers. The first is, TRIR is still a focus of our management team. I cannot get them to see past the lagging indicators and focus more on the leading indicators. How can I get them to see that the leading indicators are what we need to focus our energy on? And from that standpoint, that's really the engagement process. Remember the first step. We talk to our management about going beyond downstream indicators, showed them the model, how we got there, explained the process to get there. Eric? Well, I, I, one thing I can say is you can't do anything about it when you your TRIR. It's in the past, uh, and so if, if we're just following around TRIRs with 20 power extinguishers, we're trying to, to, to solve each one individually, we're not getting to the root cause of that problem. And so uh, lagging, lagging indicators are strictly a result of how you're doing on the front end of, of processes. So uh it it there's you know my my advice to the to the question asker is, is i can't do anything about what happened yesterday today i have to worry about tomorrow today and so it has to it, you have to you have to be able to convince them and, and i think i think that 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 issue of of not being able to do anything about what happened yesterday i think is a key a key uh, a key point and it's not making a difference for your on your hourly people Time for one more question. What would be the size or makeup of a steering committee for a 15,000 employee corporation with 200 facilities around the globe? That's a good question. And so we do steering committee at the corporate level. It's eight to ten people, and it, it does involve a vice president. It does involve a safety director for that corporation. It does involve a passionate supervision from the field and some hourly employees from the field, and you may choose a region to focus in on uh, at the first time so you can get your regional supervision and hourly employees in there. They develop a solution, they pilot the solution, and then the steering committee chooses what regions to roll it out against. 
So if you get beyond kind of 12 people, these steering teams become cumbersome. Stay focused in a region we want to improve on with the people that we can count on to improve it. All right, we take, we take one more question, Mike. As long as you're asking, I'm answering. Or <laughs> right. Eric and I are. Actually, this is for Eric. Uh, Good. Someone on the line said he's hoping, uh, that Eric, that you can give an example of how each of the six criteria for safety excellence works at Pena. Perfect. Okay. Uh, I can use our CIT number one, positive safety recognition. So uh, each week we get a weekly summary on Monday morning. It comes out automatically off our incident report system and reports all the new ones uh, over the past week. Uh, our top management is visibly committed because we we uh, we we sent it to all managers, all foremen, all supervisors. So whether uh, some of us take it, take out the take the uh, the the really top level ones, high quality ones, the safety meetings, monthly safety meetings. Some of us reply uh, personally with uh, email communication back. Uh, uh, this is uh, every business unit leader uh, focuses on their own business unit and phone calls, uh, phone calls back to an individual. Saying, you know, giving specific feedback, very sincere. It's actually, you know, that 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 shows that we're paying attention. Middle management, uh, frontline supervision, same thing. Frontline supervision has has actually uh, promoted, uh, uh, you know, performance metrics. You know, how we don't measure uh, TRIR. We're measuring on no accidents, zero. TRIR is just a calculation. Uh, they have focus on um, how many tasks observations were done, how many standard Operating procedures were reviewed. Uh, how many near miss cards do we do we? So we have some leading indicators that the that the frontline management is is uh, focused on. And please, we judge on actively participating. We know how many cards we're getting from where. Uh, we do have districts that are not providing uh, PSR cards, for example, positive safety recognition cards, in the same weighting of their number of employees there. That shows that allows us to focus and come back in and say, folks, it doesn't seem to be being used here as, as well as other areas. Do you a number they have to do, Eric? No. Uh, quotas don't work. Uh, if, I give anybody, if we give anybody quotas, they'll fill them out Monday morning by 10 o'clock and they're good for the week. Uh, quotas do not work. And so we do not set quotas. We're looking for, uh, you, know, and, you know, recognizing our PSR process has just basically rolled out from late last year into, the, into January. So we're obviously it to work uh, and then the biggest thing is what are the attitudes that uh, safety and environment advisors are hearing out there as far as how is the safe system perceived what are people talking about and that like I say I keep coming back to that water cooler talk uh, you know people are, are now visibly engaged both in our operations and our capital our new projects uh, people are talking about the right things it's it's the it's the talk and that really is very important and so that kind of heats the room up, and here in Calgary, where it's minus 21 centigrade, that's a good thing. And Abby, we're back to you. Hey, one more question. I know I said the last was the last, but I can't uh, get over how great the participation is today. Uh, how can the safety perception survey apply to an office workforce that consists of engineering, marketing, sales, legal, and management employees? And I guess that one comes to me. Uh, we find there's a, a significant difference in the safety perception scores uh, for admin people versus field people. Yet uh, you saw the processes themselves, these 20 processes, uh, they're made up of 73 questions that map to the processes. And so in uh, an admin, an office environment, when you're looking at the questions, there's some red questions in there uh, that deal with the reality of the business process in the buildings. And so some of them deal with off-the-job type of safety. Some of them deal with um, is there back that comes to safety. And so the admin groups actually end up with a different type of uh, item to work on, but they end up with items to work on. We gave a uh, safety perception survey to a large petrochemical company and as we looked at the admin scores there was one particular admin site because we drew down to those that was almost all red and we couldn't believe it and we found as we went in and did interviews 
that uh, there had been altercations in the parking lot where employees had been threatened and their personal safety was at risk. And when they did the survey, they said, this isn't a safe organization. And that led the organization then to focus in on what made a difference to the people. So I believe in doing the surveys to admin groups. You'll see a different group of things to work on, and yet the steering committee is able to focus on Concerns of a large percentage of your people by paying attention to admin. I hope that answers the question, Abby. Got okay. We got one left for. Up here, we can certainly give you one more. This is going to be it then. Okay. Let's see. We had a, such a great question. The well, last question that came through was. Uh, regarding how to make weekly safety meetings more interesting, to get people more engaged, to be more safe. Okay, it's another hour presentation, and uh, part of our webinars in the future is improving safety meetings. There are three types of safety meetings that go on in an organization typically. You saw one of them here, steering teams, that look strategically and develop a solution. There's a one at the facility level that deals with what's coming in from the field uh, that needs to be worked on at the facility. And then there's a third one, area teams. And these are work group teams that work on what are the day-to-day -day issues that have led to injuries that could lead to injuries. And that's the subject of another webinar, and I hope that the, the questioner will tune into that later this year. And I, and I would make a comment that the uh, – that, uh, uh, be an overall, overarching comment first is safety used to be safety's problem. Uh, safety is not the safety department's problem. Safety, uh, the safety department provides advice, training, support. Uh, safety is actually the work problem. And so on safety meetings, it can't be the safety person running it or the manager running it. You have to spread the load. You have to assign. Uh, you know, every one of our safety meetings has a specific topic, and that topic is actually presented by one of the uh, uh, hourly employees. They research it. They maybe it's reviewing a, a local standard operating procedure, a regulation, or an issue that's been analyzed with the help of the safety group, but is brought back by the, by a peer presenting to peers. Active hourly participation. Absolutely. That's better answer than mine was. Thank you, Eric and Abby. Thank you. All right. Thanks to both of you, and I, for those of you still on the line and on the WebEx, I want to call your attention back to the, the WebEx slide here where we have our start webinar offer. Uh, we're extending this offer to webinar participants today. It's, it's an exclusive and a limited time offer, uh, valid Thanks only uh, for the next Good. two weeks. And uh, just to let you know a little more about START, it's, it's a revolutionary training course that was reshot and updated by Caterpillar in 2012 and has helped many organizations around the world drive down incident rates and increase productivity. So the first 25 of you to purchase START using the coupon code that you see here will receive $500 off of the regular retail price. So I invite you to visit shopcatsafety.com to learn more about START and uh, to complete your order. So thank you all for attending today. You, you can expect a follow-up email from us later today or tomorrow with, with a link to the recording of the webinar as well as a PDF version of the slide deck. Thanks, everyone, and have a wonderful rest of your day.